All right, we're back uh, with part two of our conversation with uh, Dan Schmidt, another co-editor of The Giving Review, and Henry Olson, whom we introduced at the beginning of part one, uh, and biographical information about which will be in the article of which this uh, video is a part. So uh, we were just talking about uh, the Romney victory in 2012 and some of what Henry was- uh, Well, if it had been the Romney victory, life oh, would have been different. Have exactly, been. what everybody thought was gonna be the Romney victory and a project that he was contemplating at the time called, I think you said the Center for American Renewal. There's now a Center for American Restoration about which you've written and we'll maybe get to that. But uh, Dan, you wanted to- Yeah, in connection with uh, Henry's commentary on that Romney election, he was talking sort of about what the, the sort of mindset uh, the, the traditional understanding of the universe by traditional Republicans with respect to their understanding of how Romney would do in the election and so forth. And that's a supply side, small government sort of issues. Uh, I wonder if you could comment briefly in the wake of that and then on into the Trump years, whether there's been a shift, maybe not a complete overturning of sort of the means of production count economics pays the way in terms of sort of who will be elected or points the way, I should say, in terms of who will be elected and who won't be. But I wonder if, if he could comment uh, that there may be, and this is in connection with his understanding of the reaching out to uh, other constituencies for the, for the conservatives, for the Republicans, whether there's been a, a shift, subtle or maybe not so subtle, in terms of an appreciation or a need to appreciate the cultural factors, whether that's family, uh, whether that's family and marriage, children, uh, their future, uh, in, in other terms, other than pensions and, and uh, what they will do in terms of their economic situation. So I wonder if you could, could take a few seconds to comment on that, Henry. Yeah, I think there's two changes that are going on uh, now that uh, have been put in motion in the Trump administration. One is that people are now able to discuss without, um, undue harassment, uh, what would have been considered heretical in 2012, ideas about expansion of government, uh, not adopting full head-on supply side policies. It is a vibrant and vital debate that is being had right now um, that people like Marco Rubio and Tom Cotton are on one side and uh, the uh, what I call the high priests of Reaganism, uh, a religion that bears little um, a political religion that bears uh, little resemblance to the actual creed of the person they profess to worship, but which is essentially a small government supply side approach to the world. That is now a battle, whereas nine years ago when we spoke, it was not a battle. It was one that we, uh, I wanted to create, and now it is going on. With respect to culture, uh, I think what we are beginning to see also is an appreciation that people will not simply vote on their economic interests, but also vote on their life interest. And their life interest includes things beyond simply whether or not they have a higher paycheck. That it was absolutely uh, dominant in uh, Republican thinking going into the 2018 midterm, that people would only vote on their economics and that giving them a tax cut and having the economy would cause them to set aside all of these other concerns. And that theory fell flat on its face and had its booty kicked in its, uh, you know, multiple times. That still doesn't mean that people have seen the light, but there is now again evidence that, hey, we can do this and we have to have a cultural agenda that appeals to people as well. And that cultural agenda need not be, and I would argue should not be synonymous with a religious agenda. Uh, it, it has to have a strong place for religion, but it is not one that should be confused with a theological or denominational agenda, but that people want to know uh, that they live in a country that respects them as the human person and that respects their ability to raise and protect their children, uh, that allows them to worship as they please or as they please not to. Um, and also increasingly we're talking about questions of what does it mean to have free speech? What does it mean to have a rule of law? and uh, people who are making arguments that would effectively undermine that under the guise of protecting it. You know, that I wrote an article for the Washington Post where I'm a daily columnist, uh, defending, saying that Trump should be put back on Facebook, uh, that he, it's one thing to take him down when there's a threat of an insurrection or a riot. It's another thing to deny a former president of the freest country in the world the opportunity to have the same political discourse as anyone else because you don't like it. 
And what I essentially got back was a bunch of emails from people on the left saying, well, it's hate speech. We don't want to let hate speech uh, go uh, be omitted. But of course, political opponents always see their other opponent's speech as hate speech. So once you open the door, you're actually talking about a demise of the liberal order per se. And I think that those are cultural issues that increasingly play a significant part in determining voting patterns and a successful center right must address those. And in many cases must prioritize those over economic policy, although there is a strong symmetry between them and the right way to approach the economics also happens to be the right way to approach these cultural issues. Good, thank you. Assuming there's not a secret populist conservative donor class, uh, and there may be, I don't know, uh, but if not, to what degree, how would you approach the establishment conservative donor class that no, I, 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 I don't want to be overly critical because I do have support from many people who are in the you know conservative donor class who see value in my work personally. What I would say to them is to be broad-minded about other people who are doing similar work and saying that you know this is should be a broader part of our investment. I do not favor and nor do I think it is politically tenable to have a purely populist party as a political movement in the United States of America. What is needed is a symmetry, an alliance between elements of traditional conservatism and elements of what we, you know, I think can call populism, which is simply to me an adaptation of what Ronald Reagan said in his 1977 address to the, cons to the CPAC meeting, entitled A New Republican Party, where he spoke of different types of conservatism that did not agree on everything, but could both unite against a common enemy and more importantly, have core values in common that were rooted more in the question of what does it mean to be an American as opposed to what should America do with respect to its intervention in the economy. And if you simply take that 1977 speech and update it for the issues of our day, you have the way forward. And the Republican Party was in a much worse shape in 1977. You know, today it's a uh, five seat short of a House majority. Back then it had 143 seats and the 435 seat uh, House had not had over 192 since 1958. Um, it had not run the Senate since 1954 and had not had over 45 seats today. The Republican Party is at 50-50. So if Ronald Reagan could take a party that was basically one foot in the grave, and many of whose members are actually more in sympathy with the left, and turn it into what it is today, I think it would be relatively easy for a modern heir to update that way of thinking to today and create the new Republican Party that he actually built the foundation for, but his heirs never finished the house. What issues, if philanthropy of course doesn't do politics or shouldn't, but what issues might be helpful to conservatism moving forward as it looks for that sweet spot? Uh, we at from Bradley are trained to say school choice and so forth. And then I, if you feel free to do so, you can certainly mention particular groups that uh, somebody might want to consider the risk there. I know as you'll forget one or you'll miss one and get in trouble, but you mentioned the Center for American Restoration, or I did, on the basis of something you wrote, there's American Compass, but issues and groups moving forward. You know, Ethics and Public Policy Center, my uh, um, group uh, has a new president. My, the old president, Ed Whalen, was very sympathetic to my work. The new president, Ryan Anderson, is extremely sympathetic to my work. Um, you know, so we're one institution that is looking to play in this field beyond my personal work. American Compass with Orrin Cass is another. Uh, Russ Votes uh, uh, Care, you know, Center for American Restoration is a third. And then there are individuals everywhere. There are people who are working on this in universities or AEI has people who are working on it, Manhattan Institute, Her you know, so there's always individuals at these institutions. There's some institutions that are uh, more tilted in this direction than others. But, you know, I would say that a, a cons somebody who wants to be help develop policies for the whole alliance, as opposed to 
develop policies or thinking that play to only one part of the alliance should have a giving strategy that reflects that. That, you know, take a look at the poll that I just did. Um, we asked 1,000 Trump voters, uh, that, do you think, agree or disagree you know, the, to the, with this statement? The government has a uh, responsibility, the government should uh, guarantee a minimum standard of living for everyone who works to the best of his ability. I can walk down the halls of heritage and I think I know what the answers there would be. If I found one or two people who might agree with it, they would agree in a very limited way. 45% of the Trump voters agreed with that statement. We asked, which is the more important value to you, even if you don't think one is perfect for you? you know? And uh, one of them was, uh, uh, we should make, with respect to Social Security, we should maintain uh, current benefits at the same level uh, for future retirees as they are at the, for uh, the current retirees, even if it means payroll taxes go up. 63% of the Trump voters agreed with that statement. I can tell you that virtually nobody in the center-right policy economic community agrees with that statement. So they are out of step with 63% of their voters. So the question is not how do we simply adopt a fund social security, but what would social security reform look like that could give both the 37% who wanna prioritize taxes and the 63% who wanna prioritize benefits? What would that look like in practice? You know, it might look like something like focusing on benefit reduction for higher income people. It might look like something like creating a tax hole for, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about a donut hole so that the really wealthy pay social security tax for the first time, but the upper middle class doesn't. Well, what about a tax hole for the first $15,000 that you earn? That would apply equally to everybody. That would be significantly a boost to take home income for people. Uh, at the bottom, and then you could fund it with a tax increase on the upper middle class to some degree. Uh, there's a lot of ways to try and say, okay, in a coalition, there has to be compromise. It can't all be one thing. And so when you understand that the Trump movement, the conservative populist coalition sees as a positive good government action in a limited but a targeted and effective way to help people in genuine need, when you internalize that, suddenly a lot of policies become possible that when you think that government action, especially federal government action, is ipso facto morally wrong or counterproductive, those ideas never occur to you. And the fact is those ideas are not where Americans are. You have to move them in a direction and where you want, if, if you're a small government advocate, and what that means is compromise uh, in, uh, in the current moment. And that means, um, looking at those areas where limited and targeted action could be uh, addressed and created in a way that um, doesn't simply replicate the moral premises of uh, socialism or big government liberalism. Henry, may I ask you, uh, just as you did before the 2012 election, uh, saw some of these trends developing, and you made some reference in the first part of this interview with respect to It's a Wonderful Life, which is growing in the popularity, Potter versus George Bailey. Given sort of thinking now about the donor class and the way giving has changed with or without the help of Citizen United with respect to either well-to-do individuals or institutions, foundations on the conservative side, uh, is this a larger mountain to climb with respect to sort of we have to measure everything, we have to pick the right winner with respect to if we want to call it in quotes a sort of aristocratic kind of view of the universe out there, not, not an unwillingness to be George Bailey, and, and not a, a lack of appreciation for what he represented, let's say, versus Potter in that symbolic uh, fashion. Yeah. Uh, has, that, has that grown either because of institutional sort of settling in, uh, the sort of uh, battle back and forth where you divide uh, in a Manichaean way, good and evil? Uh, how, how do you sort of see that? Again, reflecting on your, your sort of, uh, the way you approached your analysis prior to 2012 when you saw some of these things breaking with respect to sort of where the voting populace was, uh, Henry? Well, you know, I think one thing that it was a trend that was going on in 2012, and I think it's accelerated, is um, donors increasingly giving, um, you know, not necessarily towards political action per se, but with um, political victory in mind as opposed to idea development in mind. 
So they're interested increasingly in mass communication in mass mobilization, as opposed to let's put together this interesting, you know, let's fund this interesting person who's talking about a relevant issue and see where it goes, even if nothing comes out of it for two or three years. You know, that what you had in the part of the Reagan administration, in part because political victory was so remote, nobody was tempted to really do the other thing, is a lot of investment in ideas. And what it meant was there was a lot of expertise and off the shelf ideas that the Reagan administration could just pull and play from. Uh, and the same was true also of the subsequent eras in the 80s and the 90s. It's difficult to remember, but uh, the Newt Gingrich revolution where the Republicans took control of the House you know, 1994 was the first time since 1952 that the Republicans had controlled the House. The first time since 1958, they had had over 192 seats and suddenly they're sitting there at 232. Um, that really, yeah, from that point onwards, can, uh, um, there was always a temptation to consolidate the political victory rather than to invest in the ideas that could then be used that were more long-term. It would be as if a military had stopped R&D on future weapons and said, let's just buy more of these tanks. Well, as long as the tanks are the best tanks out there, maybe you can win that battle. But when they stop or they're in terrain where they no longer apply very well, suddenly you'd have a dried up pipeline of things that can apply to the new battle. And that's what's happened over the last quarter century in much, not all, of course, you know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for far-sighted uh, and uh, uh, risk-taking conservative philanthropists. So I, I do not want to paint with too broad of a brush. I am grateful to the people who are willing to invest in me and the people who are investing in Others who are doing similar work, who are willing to see debate not as a threat, but as an opportunity. Um, and what I would say for center-right philanthropy is there should be more of that willingness to see debate as an opportunity and not as a threat, and less of a desire to try and do what 501c3s and c4s with very few exceptions well i mean philanthropists through foundations obviously can't give to c4s they can only give to c3s individuals can give in both directions uh, there are very few c4s who are effective at what they purport to do um, there are some and i don't want to diminish the ones that are good but i think that uh, there's been too much of a willingness and the c4 capacity to be happy with um uh, people who blow the right notes and not with people who do, uh, for all the talk about quantification and measurement and so forth, there's actually precious little of that going on. It tends to be the giving to people who, who sound notes that you like rather than giving to groups that have success. And with respect to the C3 side, um, you know, part of it is you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to uh, work within, are you, are you trying to, um, are you genuinely committed only to a small government objective? You know, well, in which case you should only give to small government groups. But if what you're interested in is solving social problems in the moment in which we find them, then pure answers are very rarely politically possible and certainly extremely rarely in free societies. You know, you can have an uh, autocratic uh, regime like Pinochet's Chile who could completely remake the social welfare system in Chile but that's not gonna happen in the United States. So we should pray that it doesn't happen in the United States, which means that change will be slower, less uh, driven by ideological consistency and be more achieved and open to political influence. And so for people who wanna play in that community, then I think what they should do is broaden their horizons and broaden their conceptions over uh, what they ought to be looking at because it should be, pretty clear that uh, the old tanks don't win the new battles without support from some new unconventional armories. Great. Well, Henry, thanks so much for doing this with us. We'll get you some uh, nice giving review uh, refrigerator magnets in the mail. Uh, appreciate Wonderful. It. Thank yeah. you.